Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Orbit Live event, Plotters, Pantsers, and Plancers, How to Outline or Not Your Novel. I'm Orbit Squibble C Director Ellen Wright, and I'm moderating the panel tonight. This is part of our virtual event series, How to Write Your First SFF Novel. If you click on the green button at the bottom of the screen, you'll see all the sessions, and you can sign up for as few or as many as you'd like. They're all free and open to the public here on Crowdcast. This event will be recorded, and a replay will be available after it ends at the same link you used to get here today. So if you enjoy the event, please share the link with your friends. This is one of the topics from this event series I've been most looking forward to, and we have a great group gathered here to discuss it. Hannah Witten is the New York Times bestselling author of The Wilderwood, or Wilderwood duology. I always pronounce that wrong, Hannah. Um, <laughs> start whatever floats your boat. <laughs> Wilderwood, Wilderwood, starting with For the Wolf, and now The Foxglove King, the first book in the Nightshade Crown series. Vaishnavi Patel is the New York Times bestselling author of Kaike and the upcoming Goddess of the River. David Dalglish is the author of a number of epic fantasy novels, including the Shadow Dance series, which began with A Dance of Cloaks, and the Seraphim trilogy, which began with Skyborn. And Craig DeLewey is an author of dark fantasy and horror, including The Children of Red Peak, Episode 13, and the upcoming How to Make a Horror Movie and Survive. For the first 30 or 40 minutes, I will be asking the authors questions for them to discuss, and after that, we'll start answering your questions. Click on the button on the right side of your screen with the question mark on it to access the Q&A section and submit your questions there at any time during the event. You can also vote on other people's questions that you find interesting. We'll probably start with the top voted questions and may not get to everyone. So we picked these four authors for this panel to get a range of opinions on planning. Some of you may be familiar with the terminology in the panel title and others may not, so here's a quick overview. A plotter is someone who figures out more or less the entire plot of their novel in advance. And a pantser is someone who writes, as they say, by the seat of their pants, or basically makes it up as they go. But not everyone fits neatly into one of those categories, so the term plantser was termed for those somewhere in between. Of this group, Craig is a plotter, Vaishnavi is a pantser, Hannah considers herself a plantser, and David brings an interesting perspective to the topic as a self-described reformed pantser turned plotter. Besides the variety of perspectives on planning, we've also brought authors who write a variety of different genres and subgenres. So let's start with each of you describing the type of books you write. And if you plan to focus on specific books for this discussion, what those are about. Uh, let's go in the order that I just introduced the way that you plan. So Craig, you're up first. Uh, yes, hi, everybody. Uh, my name is Craig DeLuy, and uh, I write speculative fiction, uh, but I'm best known for my horror novels. Uh, in this panel, uh, I may reference as an example, episode 13, which is my, my most recent horror novel. It's a found footage uh, horror uh, story or an epistolary story. Um, it's about a reality uh, TV ghost hunting crew that investigates a notoriously haunted house. And I forgot to say that that green button will also take you to links to these authors' books. So if you want to buy them or read more about them, you can do that there. Uh, so next up, Vaishnavi. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm excited to be repping the Pantsers. Um, I am primarily going to be talking about Gaikai, which is a historical fantasy, um, myth retelling sort of novel, and Goddess of the River, which is forthcoming. Um, I also write some on the more literary side, um, and I have an unannounced third book coming out, so I might mention that, but I'll primarily be focusing on those two. Hannah, how about you? I'm Hannah Witten. Hi. I write um, dark fantasy with a healthy sprinkling of romance. Um, and I am probably going to talk about all three of my books that are out, um, the Wilderwood duology and the Fox Love King, because the Fox Love King is the first in a trilogy. And my experiences with planting a duology versus a trilogy have been interesting. <laughs> And David, over to you. Hello, uh, David Douglas. I am author of 30 some novels, all of them generally in the same vibes of pulpy genre fiction, fantasy, D&D, &D, anime inspired, lots of sword fights and wizards throwing fireballs and stuff like that. Okay, so my next question is, can each of you give an overview of your process? How much do you plan of the plots in your novel, of your novels in advance and how do you do it? Um, let's start with the person who probably has the shortest answer to this question, which would be Vaishnavi. <laughs> um, I mean, yes, yeah, so I don't really plan. I have an idea in my head, 
So for Kaikei, I was like, what if I rewrote the Ramayan from the perspective of this side character? And I just sort of went with it. Like truly nothing had been written until the first words of the book. And then I just kept going until it was over. Um, Book two, I had a rough experience because it was a book that was under contract. And so I was asked to provide an outline in advance. And after considering like jumping out of a window, I did so. And then I like wrote it and it was awful. And my editor was, she was kind about it, but she was also like, something isn't right here. And I was like, can I just rewrite it? But this time do whatever I want. She was like, fine. And then I fundamentally rewrote the book doing it my way. And that's what's coming out next year. So I'd say that my process is the less on paper before the first words of the better. Let's go from probably the shortest answer to probably the longest answer. Craig, what's your process for planning a novel? Oh, okay, yeah, th- this is one I warned you. I, I might be a bit of a um, a hog on <laughs> time wise, but uh, uh, it'll be my my only long answer. Um, at, yeah, I, so I'm a plotter. Uh, I do this primarily for efficiency. Uh, product is king when you're doing when you're prof- writing professionally, and so you need to be able to get books out. I'm not going to argue with pantsing if that that works, especially if you're New York Times bestselling author. Um, I'm not going to argue with that. Whatever works for you. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, I used to be largely a pantser, and then I moved into the plotting space. The more and more I started to write professionally, at a minute, my process is as follows: at a minimum, I want to start with an uh, an ending. Uh, I'm a visual thinker, so the ending, having an ending in mind that I think really uh, sings, gives me something to write towards, and it also helps me imagine or visualize the book as a whole. I can actually kind of see the story in my head. Uh, after that, I write the I write a single sentence describing the book as the logline. Um, this is one of the hardest things you'll ever write as a as a novelist, but once you start doing it, you and you, if you do it before you write instead of after, you find a lot of benefits. Uh, I It helps me pitch my editor. Uh, when someone asks me, what's your book about? I don't tell them for two hours what my book is about. I can tell them very quickly what my book is about. Uh, so I find that really helpful. It's like that core blueprint of two or three sentences. What is the my story? Um, otherwise, I, then I have characters. So I want to do character arcs. That is, that's not plot, but it is planning. Uh, character arcs is a great way, even if you don't want to do plotting, like traditional plotting, like have your plot points all set out, you can do character arcs where you get to know your characters before you start writing by knowing what their flaws are, uh, what or misbelief is, uh, what the ghost is that caused that, how they need to change, and then you set it up where they can change through the what happens in the in the story. I find that by doing that, I really get to know the characters before I start writing, and I internalize that, and it really helps me uh, know my story, uh, and I can write it efficiently, efficiently as a first draft uh, instead of writing, you know, a hot mess first draft and then going back and doing that perfect second or third draft. I, my brain doesn't work that way. I don't really have time for that. So I want to try and do it perfect on the first go. So I find intern- plotting and then planning and then internalizing all of that before I start is a really great way to accomplish that. Um, now we get the plot, which is um, I just carve out sp- you know plot points, dividing the book into four acts, the normal, something happens that changes everything. The characters react, something happens that changes everything. The characters attack and then they go all, all in. Um, And then I may have designing principles, which is, for example, with episode 13, I knew I wanted to write it as epistolary. So I wanted to play to the advantages of that that, while downplaying the disadvantages of that. Um, And that's how I ended up with a lot of um, fly on the wall type of uh, video scripts and things like that and articles. But then I had journals for the main characters. So we would get inside their heads and have somebody to empathize with. And so I had designing principles from the get-go telling me how I was going to write this story. Um, Then there's theme, same thing. Uh, You know, this can be a simple statement, but I knew what my book was about uh, as uh, a theme. Um, Just, uh, you know, like uh, you look at a lot of Mike Flanagan's work, like Midnight Mass, it's about religion. 
uh, you know, it's great to know that from the get go, what your book is about so that you can write with an intent towards a thematic purpose. And then finally, nonfiction topics. I'll, I'll know what a lot of what my nonfiction topics are going to be like in episode 13. It was ghost hunting. It was how reality TV shows work. Uh, and these are really fun things to explore. I'm a real research hound. And I was able to start writing before I committed myself to writing. And I was able to take tons of notes, fill up notebooks full of notes. And then I started to see how the characters would fit in and how this would relate to the story. And it's just a ton of fun to share with the readers in the, on the page, but also it's a ton of fun for me to learn and to kind of internalize that, incorporate it into, the, into what my characters and what my plot was, gonna, was going to do. Uh, so all that sounds like a lot, a lot of planning, but it actually isn't a lot. Um, it's uh, it's not a huge amount of effort. Uh, it's just major points. And by in, knowing what they are in advance and internalizing that, just putting, you know, writing it down, putting it away, but then in, having it internalized, I felt like I knew who, what, who my characters were and what my story was before I started writing. And that was a huge aid to me uh, personally. But again, your mileage may vary. Great. Thank you. David, how about you? What's your planning process? Uh, I guess I'll go with the current planning process. Um, generally, I will have a story floating around in my head probably a good six months before I ever start writing it. Because generally, while I'm writing one novel, when I go on my daily walks, I'm usually imagining the stuff that's going to happen in the next novel because focusing on one thing is something I apparently cannot do. Um, so generally, I am just kind of floating around the overall big idea of what is going to make the the book, the trilogy, the world, what's going to be interesting about it, what's going to be the hook, what is going to help overall define everything. Like with something like Soul Keeper, the idea was magic and monsters reappear in a single instant across an entire world. And then from there, I, I started branching off, which is stuff I think will be neat or cool. And once I have like the vibes of that world, I then try and start thinking of the characters that would be interesting to follow in it that would be relevant due to their position towards due to what happens to them or just a character I feel like writing at the time. And then I start kind of piecing all that together. So by the time it comes to down time to sit down and start plotting it out, I've already got a lot of the characters, a lot of the setting, a lot of the main points I want to hit already in my head. And even then I will usually start writing the first five or six chapters, I will write them as if I am a pantser. I will just sit down and write, start getting a feel for the main characters, start getting a feel for the world. I'll usually kind of just get a establish the tone I want. And then once I've got a couple of the chapters, again, by this point, I've also, I'm, I'm thinking about it every day. And that's when I'll start plotting out individual chapters. I'll start going through and thinking of like, say the 20 or so big moments that I feel like are going to be in the story. I've been imagining those scenes in my head on my walks. They're, you know, confrontations with a villain or a specific event or something. And then I'll just start getting them kind of written up on Scrivener, which you can just basically write like little index cards, but it's the equivalent. I'll just have little index cards of big moments that I know I'm going to. And then I just start moving them around, trying to figure out, okay, I'm telling a story. These are the events I'm slowly getting to. How do I connect them? How do they work in a way that makes sense? How do are the motivations going to lead there? If not, how do I change motivations? Or would this even make sense for a character? And then basically I get like the bones of a story about 20 chapters done. And then I just start writing roughly in order. But uh, if I have a bad day or I sit down and be like, I don't feel like writing this incredibly detailed and exhausting battle chapter. I'll just look at my outline, and just pick a dialogue section later and just write that one and leave usually a lot of notes to myself of, hey, double check this, or this reference, you know, or like I'll leave gaps in dialogue while reference, be like, you know, reference something from prior chapter here, you know, just to eventually stitch it all together. Uh, and then usually about uh, a couple weeks into a project, I will then add another like 20 more chapters because by that point I've gotten the bones set up. I've been working with the story. I figured out the characters and now I have a much, closer to the ground feel of where the story is going and realize what's lacking, what characters need fleshed out, what events still don't lead somewhere. And this is also where I'll start changing things if it's clear something isn't working. And then by that point, I usually have the bulk of the story outlined chapter by chapter, and I just write the chapters I feel like each day until it's done. Hannah, your turn. 
So in true plants or fashion, I feel like my process is like a amalgam of all of these. <laughs> um, so I, very similarly to Craig, um, don't like to start writing until I know the ending. But it is not necessarily that I know the events of the ending so much as it is I know how I want the ending to feel. Um, so I know kind of the emotional resonance that I want to strike by that ending. And I have a general idea of the actions that's going to take place to get us there, but I'm very open to it changing. Um, and that's, that's really a key point with my process is I am always open to anything <laughs> changing. Like I've gotten to the point where I'm not really married to any huge, like any major plot point. Um, the things that I am very adamant about keeping are the theme and the emotional resonance. And however um, I can be helped in better expressing those things is cool with me. Um, but whenever I start off, it's uh, with a Pinterest board and a prayer baby. And we're just, um, I'll do like David does and kind of sit down and start writing as if I was just a pantser um, and kind of see how far that initial excitement will take me. Typically, it's like four chapters. So kind of like your introduction to the world, your introduction to the characters, your introduction to the conflict. But then whenever like actual plot and stuff has to start happening, I'm like, oh, okay, I need to actually sit down and figure out what this is going to look like. Um, so I'll do chapter summaries. Um, so I'll just sit down and write. I, I've heard it called like a zero draft. And I, I don't know if mine are involved enough to actually be zero drafts. <laughs> But it'll just be like, chapter, this happens, this happens, this happens. Next chapter, this happens, this happens, this happens. And um, especially for books that have multiple points of view, I've found that extremely helpful. Because um, then I can like make a note of whose point of view each chapter needs to be in. And whenever I go back and I'm consulting, if I, if I consult <laughs> this thing, sometimes I don't. Sometimes I write it out and I get the shape of the story in my head and I don't need to go back and look at it. Sometimes I do need to go back and look at it. Um, and in the instances where I've needed to change the point of view that a chapter is in, having it all kind of set out like building blocks has been really helpful for me. Um, but yeah, so once I have that outline, I just start writing. I'm a very linear writer. I have a hard time um, trying to bounce around. But again, very similarly to David, um, I like to like listen to my book playlists while I work out and they help me kind of get in the mindset they help me imagine like new things I have had I'm very notorious for saying like whenever I'm in the car with someone being like I want to write a book that feels like this song and I have had um songs that have kind of helped me like uh what the water gave me by Florence and the Machine helped unlock a really big thing for the Nightshade Crown trilogy which no spoilers but <laughs> thanks Florence Welch um so yeah my process is kind of chaotic. <laughs> um, but it's just as long as I have that ending in mind, as like as long as I know how I want everything to feel, and I have the ending and that um, emotional note in mind, then I feel like I can keep moving forward because I know what I'm writing toward. Makes sense. So my next question is about tools you use to plan, whether that's software, post-its, note cards. A couple of you did mention, uh, Hannah, you mentioned Pinterest. David, I think you mentioned Grivner. Um, someone in the chat has mentioned Trello for keeping track. Uh, are there any other tools that you use, whether physical, digital, um, whatever it might be? Uh, let's do this one in the reverse of the last question. So Hannah, why don't you start? A notebook, that's pretty much it. Um, a note, like a, a physical notebook and also my notes app on my phone, which if my phone is ever subpoenaed for any reason, like I will be seeing jail time. Like that, that thing is, there's a lot going on in there. <laughs> David, how about you? Uh, I have reached the point where I will do all the plotting, all the rough draft, everything is in Scribner. And once I've done a, Basically, it gets to the point where I'm ready for the final pass. Then I will port it over to Microsoft Word and do one last read through there with the font change and the size change, trying to do as much as I can to untrick my eyes and actually see some new stuff. And Craig, what are the tools that you use? Uh, 
like I'm like Hannah in that I'll use a physical notebook to to uh, take down all my notes and I'm uh, another tool would be music. Uh, I I love what she was saying about having a song that expresses a, the the novel, the mood of the novel, and sometimes I'll rely on that. Unfortunately, I, I'm not the kind of person who can write while the music is playing, but uh, you know, in those still moments of the day and um, or just listening to it, I can close my eyes and actually start to like, again, I'm a visual thinker, so I'll start to vi visualize it. So I do a lot of uh, note notebook type of work. I don't use note cards or uh, software, anything like that. Uh, mostly I use software for editing. Uh, Autocrit I use quite a bit, uh, helps me catch repeat words and all, all that stuff, passive voice and things like that. It's a really good editing program. And um, I'll also use Marlowe because uh, one of the things Hannah was saying I thought was interesting as well is the feeling, the emotional ending, like the emotional arc of your story. Do you, you know, what, what is that going to be? Um, what Marlowe does is it's the, the bestseller code people. They came up with this. It was their engine. Uh, it's an algorithm that analyzes works of literature, like you can upload your own book and it will assign values, numerical values to uh, words, uh, positive or negative, and it will actually create an emotional arc. So it'll say, yeah, you've written a rags to riches story and it, or you've written a uh, man in a whole story. And so I find that really interesting. It's These are kind of things that are hard to plot with, plan, but it's a nice reality check afterwards. But my two favorite tools for plotting itself, actually three would be a couple books. Um, Libby Hawks, uh, Take Off Your Pants, uh, which is a book about plotting for pantsers. It's planning your book, but instead of planning plot your plot, planning your character arcs, which if you know your character arc, you've got a plot. It's kind of the same thing. Um, so uh, I found that really like accessible uh, and a great way to learn about character arcs and what they're all about. Um, another is Larry Brooks's Story Engineering, which is if you want to do what Libby Hawks did, but just for plot. Uh, one of the things that he does that's really cool is he breaks up the three act structure into four acts, which made that saggy middle where you just, especially when I used to be a pantser, I'd be like, I, I don't know, I got nothing here. And so, and I don't move on to the next shiny object. Um, by breaking up into four acts and those, the, each act into different elements, it really helped me write to the next thing and really tie the story together better. I just absolutely love that approach. But overall, the absolute best book on writing period, it's for more, more geared to screenwriters, but really it's storytelling. John Truby's Anatomy of Story, highly recommend it. Can't recommend enough. Uh, to me, it's my Bible of um, for writing. And uh, I'll every time I write a book and I've got my fresh notebook with that fresh notebook, new book smell uh, attached to it, I will crack open Truby, which is all worn and and tattered at this point and just start ch doing a reality check on what I needed to internalize before I started writing. So I would say those are all my tools, but I think the most important of those, I would recommend anyone interested in the approaches I'm, I've been talking about, um, you know, read Truby and, and see if he resonates with you. Craig, there were a couple questions about Marlowe in the chat. Is that M-A-R-L-O-W-E? Is that how that software is spelled? Yeah, marlowei.com. Um, don't, don't get freaked out by the AI. <laughs> it's it's uh, the Marlowe, they're trying to create like Marlowe's a person, but that edits your books. But like what it is, is um, yeah, it'll do it like an analysis of your book. It'll look at a bunch of things like assign traits to your characters in in in, in order. But what I found, I kind of don't use most of it. But what I really love is to see, oh, you've written a rags to riches story. Like, I'm like, yeah, that's exactly what I intended to do. Thank you. And like, true, right? Um, because that's what I was going for emotionally. So it's kind of like what Hannah was talking about, like, what do I want my my story to say emotionally? Marlo will kind of say, hey, this is what it, according to our algorithm, what, how it turned out. What, what Which of those seven classic plots that endure in literature forever uh, that you've written and then it'll say, hey, your book actually is kind of like this book that's very popular um, that is similar. And uh, it'll and that's kind of interest, a little interesting reality check as well. I thought that was cool. I found that website and put it, put the link in the chat for anyone who's curious. Uh, Vaishnavi, what kind of tools do you use 
So I'm going to back up a little bit and maybe talk about the writing process, like as a, as a pantser, because, you know, there's, there's not really planning involved, but for me, the writing process then becomes really, really important. And while pantsing can seem a little like undisciplined and loosey goosey, like I say that I have like a very disciplined approach to pantsing. Like once I start writing, I write every day. I finish the book in two to three months, like a first draft. Like I just keep writing until it's done so that I don't forget where I am. I don't lose the flow. I stay in the rhythm and I just keep pushing forward. I feel that if I take too long of a break or honestly, sometimes even any break at all, it can be really disruptive to getting the first draft of the story out. And then you have to revise like really hard because there's going to be like problems and continuity errors and this and that, but probably you've captured like the feel of what you want the book to feel like and what you want the character arcs to feel like. And maybe you've gotten like a couple of great moments to cling to. Um, but I, I find that in order to make pantsing work, because my brain doesn't work well with the pre-planning, I have to then be very regimented about my actual writing process in the moment. Um, and I draft in Scrivener, and I don't use a lot of the fancy tools because I like don't plan in advance. But the thing that I love about Scrivener is that I can move scenes around like so easily. And once I have the story laid out, I can see everything, like where all the scenes are, what, where it's dragging, where it's looking good. I can move the scenes around and edit them as needed. Um, so even though I'm not using a lot of the tools that are available, just the ability to see my scenes laid out and move them around and figure out, okay, now I'm going to put a chapter break here. Now I'm going to move this scene actually should be in the first part of the novel and I'm just gonna have to revise it so that the characters don't know all the information that they know or whatever the case may be, um, that I like fundamentally restructure my book often in the Scrivener scenes app. And so I think that is really helpful. The like more ridiculous thing that I do is I'm always, when, I, when I'm drafting or once I've started drafting, I'm always thinking about the book, um, even when I like don't want to be. And so um, I set like the world's weirdest alarms for myself like as I'm going to sleep I'll think of like a line or like an idea and then I'll set an alarm for myself for like 1 35 p.m that's like this snippet and I'll have completely forgotten it and then I'll get like the weirdest alarm while I'm in court or something um but it works like I I set alarms for myself and that's how I remember my thoughts um or any notes app I guess if you remember to check it I just wouldn't remember to check it so it would languish there forever um, but once you start thinking about the book, like remembering all the ideas or the scraps that you want to put in there, um, like having some system for that, um, I think is helpful. Yeah, you mentioned continuity. Um, and my next question was going to be a perfect segue. If you are a pantser or a planter, so Vice to me and Hannah, how do you keep track of continuity if you haven't planned something out in advance, whether it's you know, what day of the week is it? What happens before something else? What color are those characters' eyes? Um, Vaishnav, um, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I can. <laughs> so I recently sent a draft of book four to my agent, and it takes place over a period of 40 days. Like, that's very important to the story. And there's a lot of Wednesdays in the book, like way more than five. Um, and there's like a lot of or in the first draft, I should say, there were a lot of Wednesdays, there were a lot of Thursdays, there were like two weekends in 40 days, um, just a lot of a lot of continuity problems. And I know as I'm writing that I have these problems. So what I do is once I start writing, I usually have a separate like note for myself where I'm just jotting down notes of like, you made a continuity mistake here. And at some point you're gonna have to fix it. Like I'm flagging these things for myself. I'm like, it can't be Wednesday for the third day in a row. Like you're gonna have to go back and fix this. Um, and so I keep track of things that I'm, I know that I'm going to have to fix. And then in my first editorial pass, that's probably the main thing that I look for is like, I have broken the plot in several places by not having one in the beginning. Um, let me fix it, patch it up, patch up the timelines, or I've had stories where it's like, um, there are flashbacks within the chapters and then it's like, uh, where 
where am I? Like, <laughs> where is the flashback? Do the characters, shouldn't the characters know in chapter one what happened in the flashback that took place before chapter one? But it seems like the flashback is a revelation to the character that it's happening to. Like, things like that where um, I just sort of have to, I, I know that I'm, I'm going to have continuity problems and probably significant ones. And so when I go through, that is one of the things I'm, I'm looking for and I'm maintaining. I will also say I don't write epic fantasy. I think it would be very, very hard to write epic fantasy or possibly impossible the way that I do. I write, you know, historical, um, literary books that could be set in the real world. And so the thing is, I don't have major like setting continuity problems or like the what is the culture of this place? What is all of these elements I have from the real world? And I don't have like seven continents and 30 kingdoms and this and that, or like very complex magic systems I have to keep track of. And that makes it easier from the um, continuity perspective. So I, I acknowledge that the genres I'm writing in make that easier. I have my handy dandy notebook wherein I will make notes like you have to fix this later. <laughs> Um, because I, I do run into continuity ugh, continuity errors a lot. Um, I will often be right like I whenever I was going back and reading the first draft of um the Hemlock Queen, I realized that I had like dramatically revealed the same information like four different places, <laughs> and everybody was acting like this was a brand new information every time. Anyway. Um. And so things like that, I will have to go back and be like, oh, wait a minute. Like, I've, I've done this already. We got to figure out, like, which place is the most effective for having this reveal, actually. Um, and whenever I notice that I'm doing that, literally, I will just write a checklist in my notebook. Like, as I'm drafting, I have a checklist going of, um, like, he here's the next few things that need to happen. And usually there's a lot of like arrows. Like it looks like that one still from it's always sunny that people always use with like Charlie has the, the notebook or the board behind him with all the string and stuff. That's what my notebooks look like. Um, so it's like pointing the circles and things are crossed out and it's pointing like this happens and this happens. And then that's, that will lead to this. Um, and then I have like a clean list behind that. That's like list of things to fix on first editorial pass. And it'll be things like this person references something that they weren't actually there for. You need to add them to that scene. Or this person only shows up for like two pages and then they're gone. If you're going to have them there, they need to have more going on. Um, so it's just a very slowly going back and kind of spackling over the continuity errors as far as, um, you know, knowing how many Wednesdays are happening in a book, um, I just send it off to the copy editor and trust that they're going to catch it. <laughs> and they do. And I hope they don't hate me, but they probably do. And they're justified. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I do want to add in there's. I don't want anyone to think that like, oh, you, you have a really detailed plot or outline. That must mean you don't have continuity errors or anything like that. No, I, I have fully plotted out, like with Voidbreaker, I had everything plotted out, but then I moved a chapter and then rearranged another chapter and then realized these events didn't work. So I moved that chapter. And then during my first edit through, realized I had a character that died two chapters prior having a conversation <laughs> and was just there and i have to leave a giant note for myself that says this idiot is dead remove for when i did my next editing pass so no there's no magic bullet pantsing or plotting that suddenly removes continuity errors or too many wednesdays they're they're just always gonna be there so uh and if anything like and I, there's also this idea like i hope no one thinks that like oh pantsing is you know easier because you just like free it uh, no i've I have found this plotting method I do, I do it because it's easier. <laughs> so I I do it because I can write books faster. Pantsing is absolutely harder. Uh, it produces, I think, different feelings of books that are hard to replicate. It's not necessarily better or the other, but I do think uh, you can sometimes, not sometimes. Uh, but no, that's my two cents. I'll silence now. I always run into continuity errors with travel. 
because I do write epic fantasy and people are often going places, often on boats, which has been well established. I don't know how boats work. I will never write a point of view character that knows how a boat is working. There will always be a line that is like, and people were doing things with ropes. She didn't really know what, because I just want to establish none of you should expect for me to give you any information on sailing over the course of this chapter. So continuity, certainly not a problem that's unique to pantsing or plantsing, but, but one of the problems that's common to it. Uh, on the plotting side for Craig and David primarily, have you ever found yourself off track and realized that departing from the outline would improve the story? And what did you do, especially if you already had, you know, other parts of the story that depended on it? Craig, it looks like you want to answer that. Uh, sure. The, the answer is, of course. Um, plotting... You know, uh, we're, when you talk about plotting versus plancing versus, uh, you know, pantsing, uh, really we're talking about a spectrum, right? Uh, what works for you, what works better for you uh, in your circumstances and the way your brain works. Um, so when I'm writing, you know, and I have my plot points set up and I know my characters and so so on, uh, there's a process, if, you know, I wouldn't call, you call it pantsing, but I call it discovery, but it's really the same thing. I'm pantsing, but I'm pantsing towards a goal. Um, and of course, when you start writing and you start in that process of discovery, you are discovering, you are discovering your story, what it wants to be. You are discovering your characters, who they want to be. Even if you feel like you really know them from the get-go, and that was an advantage for you, they're going to start doing things they want to do not necessarily what you want to do or the way you imagined it would line up perfectly in a plot. And so these, uh, you have to, I think as a writer, you have to listen to that. I tend not to change the endings to my stories. I tend to want that, um, uh, that, that, um, that, that big finish, that thing that sings that has really been driving uh, my creative bus all along. So I tend not to change the ending, but yeah, there will be, characters are going to say, nope, I'm doing this. I'm not doing what you thought I was going to do anymore. And I'll say, yeah, okay, I'm going to listen to you because you're the character. And that sounds very Zen, you know, like, oh, listen to your characters. They're going to do what they want. And, but it's, it's the, there's no other way for me to describe it. It's true. It's just how it works creatively, at least for me. And uh, again, in that process of discovery, you find out all sorts of things where you plan something out and, you know, the, the outline I'll have given my editor is kind of, a lot of it's out the window by the time I hand in the book. Um, but I wouldn't have traded in that planning to get there, you know, to, to, to get into that discovery and to be able to make those decisions along the way. It really all works together for me. Yeah. I like, I kind of view the outline as more of like a giant roadmap that is taking me from one location to the other. And that doesn't mean I can't, suddenly change a little bit in terms of where I'm going. Uh, it's a, it's incredibly common for me to have things where I'll just be like, oh, this isn't working. I'm going to change something. Or I'll be like, you know what? This sounds like a lot better idea. And then what I need to then do afterwards is to look at my outline and go, OK, what are the ramifications of this change? How does it echo on through the rest of it? Is it going to change a lot? Is it going to change a little? Are some, is some stuff going to be tossed out the window, which always sucks. but even when I was pantsing, I'd also have times where I'd go three chapters down a path and be like, none of this is working. I have to chuck all of it anyway. Um, but I've had probably the most common thing is I'll have characters like I had a character in Sapphire Altar that I was like expecting to die in like chapter 10. I was like, no, this character's way too much fun to write. They're living now. And then had to look at the entire outline and be like, well, uh, crazy powerful former villain is now alive. How is this changing things? And just go through, add notes. I mean, sometimes it'll be something as simple as go find a, a scene already written and just be like, add so-and-so. And I always, I find editing easier than drafting generally. Uh, so like, even if I have to almost completely rewrite a conversation, I will still find that easier than sitting down at a blank page and writing that conversation from scratch. So generally just, uh, it just like, when things go off the rails or I make changes, it just means like a thousand little notes scattered throughout my entire rough draft, telling myself, usually in sarcastic terms, things I need to do later or remove or fix or, you know, take the dead person out of the scene. All right. There are a lot of really great questions from the audience. So I'm just going to ask one more thing before we go over to those, uh, which is about planning things besides 
plot. We've been talking about outlining, planning the plot, um, but to what degree have you planned out things like the characters, the world building, um, other things, other background information like that before you start writing? Um, let's start with the traditional fantasy writers. So Hannah and David, uh, Hannah, how about you? I have said before that most of my ideas come to me in the form of what kind of romantic angst would I like to write this time? So I spend a lot of time um, with that and kind of, uh, I am very much a writer where the character informs the story more so than the other way around. Um, so I spend a lot of time thinking about character arcs, uh, thinking about how the characters interact with one another and how that is going to move the plot forward. Um, and just kind of, I I've also said before that me revising is just like building stilts underneath things that I think are cool so that I can keep them. Cause like uh, we're writing all in vibes. And then after that, it's like, okay, I need to provide justification for these vibes if I would like to retain the vibes. So I um, plan romantic arcs and character arcs. Pretty meticulously. David, how about you? I feel like I've already said this as much. I'll try and keep it short, but generally when I am cooking the story in my head in those months prior to ever starting it, the characters are generally the number one thing I am imagining and focusing on. I'm trying to think of who are the people I want to hang out with, get a feel for like their personalities, their vibes. Uh, if it's epic fantasy, usually how they're going to fight or kill people if they do. Um, and then kind of figure out how they're going to collide with each other, who's a villain, who's the hero, and then start building the settings in the world around them. So I, I generally have that all in mind before I ever start. And it's just, when I actually start writing, it's me getting to, I'm not discovering that stuff for the first time. I'm just trying to do my best to convey the stuff I've already had in my head in a way that is as cool as I would like to think it is in my head. The hardest part of writing anything, I think, is the disconnect between what's in your head and what you're able to get on the page at first. Because oh, sorry. Yeah, just things that seem super cool in your head, and then you sit down and you write it, and you're like, wah, wah, that did not do what I wanted it to do. And then you have to go back and poke at it continuously until it does what you want it to do. My first editor, Debbie at Orbit, would constantly give me the same advice over and over again. And it was, I know you know it. I need it out of your head and on the page. Because <laughs> I had a real bad a habit of that, of just assuming things like, oh, like, why did so-and-so do this? I would give a lengthy explanation. She'd be like, great, none of that's in the book. Put it in. <laughs> yeah. Be that actually, like, I got a very similar note whenever I was um, first revising Wolf, and it kind of changed the way that I looked at writing general, like, planning and just drafting generally was very, like, no one knows until you tell them, but you have to come up with, like, a natural way to tell them. And that um, has helped me out a lot. <laughs> Nice to meet. How much do you plan of your characters in the world before you start writing? So I think with pantsing, you still have to have like a story idea. Like somebody is doing something somewhere in order to just put words on the page. So I often know, like I, I have an idea of a question I want to explore. Like what if the evil stepmother character was like the good guy in the story? Or um, what if... India never won independence in 1947 or things like that, like I ideas that I'm exploring. And I usually have an idea of the character who's going to be telling the story or the characters who will be telling the story. Um, and because of that, I often have, I don't necessarily know what I want the last scene to be. Um, I don't know what I want the final, maybe even emotion to be, but I do know sort of how I want to feel about the story as a whole. Like if I want it to be hopeful or, um, sorry, the lemon content is really <laughs> distracting me, which is my own fault. Um, but I kind of, I have an idea of how I want the characters to feel is what I'm trying to say. At, like at some point in the story or at some point at the end of the story, I, I know how I want them to have felt. And it's not necessarily something I can put into words when I sit down to write, but I do have these like feelings about it. So 
I, I do have a, like an idea of where I'm going to start. And with all of my books, they've required research because I'm writing about a particular historical time period or a particular myth or a particular movement. And so I, I have enough of an idea where I have like researched the setting enough that I can like get a draft down rife with notes about how I need to do some research and fill it in um, because it's never enough. Uh, so I, I do have some ideas or thoughts about it, but I don't often know where I want to end up or even what the answer to the question that I'm asking is. I just know that I'm asking a question. I hope by the end of this, I can give a lemon update, but I actually don't know what the odds of that are. I feel bad for anyone that might be watching this after the fact and doesn't have the chat open because they're going to think we're all nuts. Uh, Craig, how much planning do you do on character and world building? Um, yeah, as, as as much as I can, honestly. Like the, the, For example, with episode 13, like I said, I learned a lot about ghost hunting. I learned uh, about how reality TV shows work um, and ended up playing a ton of Phasmophobia, which is the Steam game. Uh, yeah, I've played that with my son, Alex, who was 11, uh, 10 or 11 at the time. And we would get really scared. Like, it's a scary game because you can't see the ghosts. So you just know they're there and they're becoming more aware of you. And there's a psychological dread in that game. You could, I was like, God, I want to bottle this. And so I would play tons of that game to get the way uh, some of you uh, other other authors might listen to certain songs. I was playing that game to like get into that mood. Like, so uh, yeah. So I, but yeah, like uh, I said, I'll I'll try and plan everything from a uh, plot to designing principles on how the book would be writ written or told. The story would be told to not various nonfiction to topic. Your audio cut out there, Craig. No. Uh, maybe try disconnecting the headset. Yeah. The lemons got him. You, uh, if you introduce lemons in the first act, you have to bring them back in the third act. <laughs> Check off lemons. <laughs> well. Yeah, Craig, why don't you try uh, refreshing and coming back in? And while he's doing that, we will move over to the audience questions. Uh, so the top the audience of... questions are just going to be about lemons. Only about lemons. Yeah, but no other questions. The top <laughs> one isn't lemon related. I'm very disappointed in the chat. Um, so the top voted question right now is, how do you get past that initial rush of excitement when the bits of story that inspired you are down on paper but now you have to do the harder and possibly less inspiring work of filling in all the connective stuff that will make the story hang together. And I think that could go either during the plotting process or during the writing process, depending on, on how you plan. Um, does anyone want to take that one to start? Whenever you're writing and it's not contracted, you just have to decide that you're going to finish it. Um, my first, uh, like first forays into trying to write a book, um, you always kind of get to a point where it's like, this isn't fun anymore. This feels like work. And uh, it's very easy to just put it down whenever you reach that point. But if you want to do it, like if you want to pursue publishing, if you want to put books out there, you got to finish books. So um, it's really just kind of like a buckling down and making yourself thing. Um, and then, you know, once it's contracted, you finish it because you have to. <laughs> Craig, are you back? Uh, yes. Yeah, I think. Yep, we can hear, can you hear me. Right. Okay, good. Uh, to leap onto the question, uh, there is no easy way. Once the, like, once you've started, once you've gotten all the fun stuff out, you've you had the fun, like, oh, here's introduce the characters and make them all mysterious or interesting. And we've got all the things in motion, all the balls are in the air, and now it's time to juggle them. Um, it's not easy. It's not always fun. Sometimes it's it can feel like pulling teeth. And I mean, it is one of the reasons why I have my outline out bounce around and be like, I don't feel like I have the just the focus to do this scene right now and I'll just skip around. But like that's that's the hard part. And for me, when I was doing when I was starting out, uh, I would often like try to change a scene to make it more interesting to me. Like, oh, I'll suddenly fight out of nowhere or I'll kill a character I wasn't planning on killing. And I was just like, 
effectively me trying to cheat the process and be like, oh, well, you know, this connective tissue is getting kind of difficult or frustrating. Let me just blow it up. Um, I try not to do that as much. Uh, and instead just, if I'm feeling like something is dragging out or it's difficult or it's not as fun, I will try and see if it's actually just because I'm in, I'm on you know, 60,000 words of a 120,000 word novel, or if it's a thing where the scene actually is coming out twice as long as it needs to be, and I just need to move on and just cut the chapter short. And, but yeah, it's, it's never going to get easier. I can sadly inform you of this after many, many books. <laughs> so. I think it's Susan Dinner that has talked before about having cookie scenes um, in your book that are like, scenes sprinkled throughout that you were excited to write and trying to like have those throughout so that you're not writing everything you're excited about right at the beginning. And then it's like, Oh, well now what? Um, so I found that very helpful. And also um, like David was saying how sometimes the connective tissue of like, we are walking from point A to point B, like you don't actually have to write that out. You can be like, once they got to point B, um, and whenever I'm writing something and it just feels like I'm banging my head against a wall, it's like, is this something that I can hand wave? Do we need this? <laughs> and giving myself permission to hand wave whenever the hand waving is appropriate has also been very helpful with finishing things. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. And I also say that when you're purely pantsing, sometimes um, you don't. I at least feel I don't get those feelings of being stuck as often because everything is new to me. I have no idea where I'm going. Like every scene could be a big fun scene to write. Or sometimes I don't realize I'm writing like a boring but essential connectivity scene until I'm almost done with it. And so to an extent, um, having pants completely and not knowing what each scene is really going to like what the tenor of the scene is going to be until I'm in it um prevents me from having some of those feelings I mean I wouldn't recommend pantsing as the strategy for pushing through um tough scenes uh because that's not going to work for the novel as a whole if it's not um the way that you're you write or the way that your brain is happiest when writing but it does um it does help Our, our next top of the question is about a different kind of getting stuck. What's your process when you write yourself into a corner? Do you review and rewrite the outline in early chapters, outline possible outcomes from there, power through without planning to see where it takes you? Uh, what do you do if you're in, in the middle of writing and you get stuck? I'm going to be a hog and answer first again because this happens to me often. Um, I will go back to the neck, the last like major choice that a character made and make a different choice. And usually whenever I do this, um, I, it does like require me to kind of revisit my outline if it's something major. Um, but a lot of times it's not necessarily something that's going to change the overarching plot. It's just going to change kind of how we get there. So, um, yeah, I'll just kind of go back to the last decision point and make the opposite decision and see if that takes me closer to what I want um, this journey to feel like. Because uh, typically, whenever I feel like I've written myself into a corner, it's not necessarily plot wise. I feel like I've written myself into a corner. It's like this is not feeling the way I want it to feel like something has th the vibes are off. <laughs> we need to recalibrate. Um yeah, so I'll just, I'll go back to the last, like, pinch point and rework it from there. And sometimes that fixes it, and sometimes you realize that the first choice that you made was actually the right one, and you just maybe needed to tweak it a little bit. So whenever I go back and do that, I don't, like, delete everything up to that point. I'll just, like, put it in a different document so that on the off chance that was actually the way I needed to do things, it's still there, and I can put it back in as needed. Um, Anyone else have thoughts? Yeah, okay. yeah I, I I punt this one to my subconscious. I just <laughs> just sort of like walk away from it a little bit. And uh, if I'm stuck, it's usually rare because I kind of like again, I know I know where where I'm going. So if I end up stuck or I've written myself into a corner, 
it's a pretty serious it's a rare but pretty serious crisis for me and so i'll i'll just have to let my subconscious work on it and then suddenly the answer will just just come to me and i'll just have to to trust that and be patient with it even though it makes me crazy i want to fix it Uh, I basically have two methods, and the first is I will put on headphones and go for a walk and spend like 40 minutes explicitly thinking about whatever is bothering me, if it's a specific chapter, if it's a character storyline, whatever it is, if I have that gut feeling of something's not right and I can't figure out why, I'll just think through, if it's a character, I'll think through what I'm planning I'm having to do. Why is that not working? Maybe the motivation's wrong. Maybe the setup is wrong. Maybe, you know, I just everything needs to be worked. Um, and generally that will solve it, even if it sometimes involves finishing the walk going, all right, these three chapters need thrown in the trash and I need to do something different. And if that doesn't work, I have a friend, Rob, that I call and I'll be like, hey, I'm stuck on something. And they're like, can I just ramble? He's like, yeah, all right. And I'll just start talking out loud the entire problem. And half the time he won't say anything and I'll have solved the problem by the time I'm done talking. So I also... For Breed, my editor, I will do the same thing with emails when I have questions. I will often compose an email of a problem with a character or plot point, and then by the end of the email, I will solve it, and I'll just finish the email and be like, could talk and send it to her anyway. <laughs> so, There are two related questions about uh, revealing info, so I'm going to read both of these. One of them is, how do you plot clues without being too subtle or too obvious? This is a person who likes to create an aha moment, but struggles to do that without either burying the clue in the plot or making it way too obvious. And then the second question is, oh dear, where did it go? <laughs> Lost the question. Uh, for planners, do you try to plan when to reveal info or write more chronologically in the first draft and then pull scenes out later for editing? Uh, I guess. Okay. <laughs> oh, go ahead. Right. I, no, say, no, I can give a very brief answer about how you did this as a answer, which is that as the story develops, I find that you start naturally leaving clues, like you, you start developing an idea of where the story is going and you leave them. But there have been times where like I, I realize at the end I'm going to have set up that like somebody was actually a bad guy or somebody was actually a good guy, which is actually a more common reveal in many of my stories. Um, and then I, I have to go back and do that during the editing process. And it's it's hard to describe, but I think that the way I do it is I think of like where I, I kind of divide the book into parts and then up until up until the reveal. And I'm like, okay, in this part, like how how likely do I want it to be that somebody is going to guess? And then I'll think about what I need to say about that character to be like, I guess you if you found out this information as a spoiler in this section, you would not be like felt you would not feel completely betrayed that I lied to you, but you would otherwise have no idea. And then in the second section before the reveal, maybe I want it to become a little more obvious or make sure that it is in fact affecting the plot, but um, still keep it light. And then maybe I'll leave like a bigger clue right before the reveal so that people can like um, come to the conclusion themselves if that's what I want. Uh, but I, I kind of have to be deliberate about that in the editing process and go back and sometimes completely change scenes in which the character is in because I've realized that they were in fact a good guy or a bad guy and should be acting slightly differently accordingly. But most of the time I find that like subconsciously, if you've, deci if the, you've decided that this character is going to have this role or you've decided that uh, this thing about the world is going to be revealed, like you start leaving those hints especially if you're not writing in off of an outline um and you're just sort of like winging it day by day uh yeah i was, I was, I was just, i like that answer uh i was just gonna add that um when when you're when you're a planner uh you would do you have the opportunity to drop those in if those are important uh i like one of the comments, uh, the best aha moments are when I think, oh, my God, and yet I should have seen that coming. Yeah, so, yeah, you want to give the reader all the all the tools they need to figure out X. But and that, but at the same time, when X arrives, they're like, yeah, it makes total sense. But it is still surprising or it's still a lot of a lot of fun. This is really hard to map out. Uh, yeah, so you can you can uh, do that as best you can. 
but it's one of those things that I think uh, I, I personally at least will do a lot of polishing to try and get it right. I'm terrible at keeping secrets when it comes to fiction. And so I like to, I like to say to the reader, okay, this is what you need to know. Right. But you, you, you have to tease, you can't do that. Um, it makes me a little bit crazy because it's so against my personality. I want, I, but I want you to understand what I'm writing here. I want you to understand. Um, sometimes you had to tease them. You have to keep secrets and uh, you can plan that as best you can, but it's really something you're going to have to do a reality check on and uh, handle in a polish or a revision. I, that would be my guess as to how I think a lot of people are going to, a lot of writers are going to end up doing it. That's how I would do it. Anyway. It's really hard to like judge if you're good at it or not, because it's it literally all comes down to the individual reader on whether they're going to like put those things together or not. Cause you can be as subtle or as obvious as you want. And every individual reader, you know, every person is bringing their own experience with whatever genre you're writing and their own kind of perceptions of things to the book, whatever they come to it. So you can have. We're having an issue with your. We're having an issue with your audio there, Hannah. Oh, I think it's better now. I think something might have rubbed on your microphone. Yeah, you're good now. Oh, cool. Anyway, my microphone was also like, you're not good at this. Stop. <laughs> um, I was just saying, um, you, every reader is bringing their own experience to a book. And I mean, that's true of you, any book with any genre with anything you're trying to do, but you're going to have some readers that are like, I didn't pick up on any of this. And some readers that are like, I knew where this was going from the first page. And um, I, I think that I personally tend more toward um, revealing too much. Like Craig was saying, cause I'm like, I really want you guys to get this thing that I did. It's really cool. <laughs> and, like sprinkled them through that way. Um, but I tend to, when I'm drafting, kind of leave everything on the table and then have to go for a revision and like prune back and prune back and prune back until I reach a point where I feel like this is subtle enough to where if the characters don't get it, you're not going to be yelling at them. But obvious enough to where an astute reader is going to pick up on it and be able to, because I, I love it whenever I can put stuff together right before it's confirmed. That's That's what I'm going for. The way I view it is that there is the truth of what is actually going on, whatever the twist is, say a character is secretly evil, to give it a simple example. Um, and then there is the illusion that you are trying to maintain. And generally at the earlier parts prior to the, the twist, I'll try and make sure it's things like comments or actions that have, that when looked back on serve the truth, but have simple, easy, obvious explanations for why they also serve the illusion. Offhand comments that you could take a certain way and it doesn't seem odd. And then you get as you get closer to the twist, I start making things that if you are catching it, it doesn't match the illusion, but there's no reason for you to think it's anything else other than, oh, that was odd or something you just double, you know, like you might make you hesitate a moment. Um, and then generally uh, it comes to the big reveal and then you're like, okay, here it is, and you just try and, I think all of us understand the same feeling of, you want it to hit as hard as you can, like you want to just smack the reader with it, and you try and set every circumstance around it to build up to where the reveal means something, instead of just like offhandedly mentioning it, and then, because you don't want the reader to not know it, you want to smack them in the face with it, because you put work in that. Um, I, this is one of the things that I noticed when I started doing more plotting is, I would have events that people would not see coming, but they would usually not see them coming because I didn't see them coming. The actual forethought multi-book twist was not something I ever did in any shape or form until I actually started plotting out and trying to actually have an idea where things were going beforehand. So it's something I think I have gotten better at, um, but for the most part, I never used to worry about that because I never knew who would live or die at the end of one of my epic fantasy stories when I was pantsing it, so didn't need to worry. Well, we have definitely run out of time. I feel like we could keep talking about planning and apparently about lemons for another hour, um, but it is five minutes past the hour, so we are going to wrap up. Um, there are a couple of questions that I am going to answer very quickly. I feel like these sound like they were almost plants, but I swear they weren't. Uh, MG asks, I hope a friend can see this. Will a recording be available? And the answer is yes. Uh, there will be a recording available at the same link as 
pretty much as soon as we wrap up. It might take a couple minutes to process, um, but just send your friends this link. We'll also be uploading all of the recordings on the Orbit Books YouTube account. And someone else, Tim, asked, are there recordings of the older workshop somewhere? And the answer to that is also yes. Uh, I'm going to put a link in the chat that will take you to the landing page for the whole How to Write Your First SFF Novel series. And you can watch those replays also on Crowdcast or also on the Orbit Books YouTube account. Uh, can I just say, I'm so sorry to anybody who watches this not on live and doesn't have the context for, for why for the lemons entered the collective consciousness. We'll just have to read through the entire chat to make sense of it. Um, well, thank you all for attending and for your great questions. Um, please do sign up for, for more sessions. We've got a couple more later this week that I think will be a lot of fun. Um, follow us on Crowdcast to be notified about other upcoming events. Um, and thank you to Hannah Vaishnavi, Craig, and David for all of your wisdom on the planning process. Good luck with your novels, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.